the advertisement, actually I'm going to talk about this, the advertisement was for quality of care. I'm going to talk about organization of a major academic practice. But in the interim, since agreeing to do the talk and today, I actually made a, the reason I was getting the talks ready is I was making a trip to China. So I've been to China and back and gave this talk, well, a version of this talk in China about five or six times. And so I changed it to this. A, a lot of what I was going to talk about, about the United States, you already know. I've kept some of the stuff in that at least some of you may not know or may be of interest to some of you. But then from what I gleaned from the trip that Colleen Clancy and I made to China, I decided to, uh, decided to throw in some of those things. And some of those contrasts are actually quite interesting and quite instructive for us. Hopefully you'll think so at the end of my talk. But here we go. So I was asked to go to China and give, this was one of the talks I was giving in China, as I mentioned. And I was asked to just talk about who we are and how we're organized. Um, this was one of my introductory slides and um, kind of shows that we're a big place. We have lots of different training programs. We have a, a pretty big hospital by our standards. Um, we do all these regional things. Um, we do some research. We have lots of staff and faculty and lots of residents. And then the four components of our system, the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, the Medical Center, the hospital, and then the Practice Management Board, which some of you, particularly residents and students, don't know what that is. That's our version of a multi-specialty practice group, and that's the group that I'm the executive director for. So we went to uh, we went to four places in China. I'll show you the I'll show you the places we went in just a second, um, and their organization was somewhat different. The School of Medicine was kind of everything. It was medicine plus, uh, plus um, nursing, plus pharmacy. And then they had big hospitals, enormous hospitals, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and that's really the two main elements that they had. They didn't have a, a faculty practice group like we do. Um, they really didn't. They, it was really, everything was about the hospital. Sometimes it feels like that's the case here too, but it's not. Um, this was another slide I showed uh, with the area that we serve here in Northern California outlined in black. Um, big region, both urban and rural. Uh, we see about a million patients a year, uh, outpatient visits a year, do 32,000 hospital admissions. And then this was a little bit redundant, but we have all of these different specialty services that we do. So we went uh, to China, which is as you know, it's big. It's big in a lot of different ways. It, that was one of the things that really struck me. And I don't know how well it's going to show up here on the pointer. Can you guys see that pointer at all? No. Okay. Shows up really nicely on my palm, but it doesn't show up here. I'll just have to point. Um, we went to a place called Shandong. I don't know if you can see it. It's up on the right. It's on the coast, on the east coast of China. We went to Shandong. Um, which is a province in China. It's just south of Beijing. And we went, to, um, we went to three different cities, visited four places, but went to three different cities. And there's one there called Binju. You can see one called Zibo and one called Laocheng. The capital of the province is Jinan. That's the one with the star in the middle. We did not go there. And we would go to these places, and they were, they were these, what seemingly very large cities, and we'd ask the people there, uh, okay, well, you know, how does your city match up so to, to others? And they would say, well, you know, we're really, really not that big a deal. It's kind of a small place. Just to give you some idea of the enormity of China, those are the populations of those three places. So the smallest place we went, and they were, they kind of considered themselves a backwater, had 3.8 million people. <laughs> Um, the biggest place we went, Laocheng, the last place we went, has 5.8 million people, and that makes it, for China, the 114th biggest city in China. To be a real city in China, you've got to have at least 10 million. And then the really big cities have 25 plus million. So just to give you some idea of the enormity of the place, not just in terms of geographic size, but in terms of people. And that has some relevance 
to the medical care that's practiced there. It's, it's different in part because there are just so many people to take care of. And I'll come back to that a couple of times. So this was a really pretty picture, I, a group of pictures I put together to show them UC Davis. I was very impressed. I thought they'd be very impressed with the size of our hospital, all the different things that we did. <laughs> this was the smallest place we went to, and it had all these buildings. And as I'll show you in a second, of the four places we visited, two of them didn't think they had enough room, so they were building more. So this was a slide they gave us uh, when we went to that. This is, again, the smallest place. Um, they had 1,930 beds. This was one of the places that was building an additional 1,500 beds. Um, the two places, maybe I'll just talk about it now, the two places that were building additional beds were building them kind of out in the suburbs from the city. They had downtown hospitals. They were building them out in the suburbs because as the marketplace changes, as the way of life changes, and as the middle class grows and people have more money, which is a remarkable change in China over the last 20, 30 years, there's an increasingly insured market, and there's an increasing, uh, increasing number of people who have cash to pay for their care. And so they were building hospitals, big hospitals, on the outskirts of town to cater to that trade. Uh, in one case, they had an imaging center that they were building as a joint venture with an Italian company. So big hospitals, this one about 2,000 beds. Um, the, they've discharged about 92,000 patients a year. I think I told you that UC Davis, it's about a third of that. But you can see they've got far more beds than we do, and the proportion of beds to discharges is different than ours. Their length of stay was somewhere in the neighborhood of eight days for most things. Um, total patient visits, one, one and a half million. Again, their ability to see patients was compromised some, by some of the technology that they don't have. Um, our, ours, our number, remember, was a million. And this is, again, with a number of beds, it's about three times ours. And then the number of surgeries they did was somewhat impressive. So I told you that they were um, building new hospitals. These hospitals would go up fairly quickly. I'm not sure how they'd do in an earthquake. <laughs> but they but they would go up fairly quickly, and Colleen Clancy, who some of you may know, she's the associate vice chancellor for um, academic affairs. If you want a promotion, uh, her your paperwork goes through her office. Um, she was there to talk about that promotion process to the Chinese audience, and there we are in our Chinese hard hats um, outside one of those uh, big new construction projects on the outskirts of town. It took us about. 30 minutes to get there from the main hospital where we've been visiting. So I also talked about our School of Medicine, talked about how happy our medical students are. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, showed pictures of them smiling, at least. Um, and some relatively small, uh, and told them about our class sizes and how we were very excited about the fact that we were going from roughly 100 to 110, and we had these special programs. Um, they talked a little bit about their training. Um, boy. They talked a little bit about their training. It's organized a little bit differently. I can't pretend to have learned all the details of this. It's organized a little bit differently. Perhaps one of the more interesting things that I did learn for sure is that their medical school model is more like uh, a European model. And what I mean by that, for those who don't know the European model, is that you don't go to college before you go to medical school. You go straight into medical school after the, whatever the country's equivalent of high school is. You go to medical school for five years, and it really is much more analogous to a college education than it is to a medical school education in that you don't do very much clinical work. At least in Europe, you don't do very much clinical work. Um, and there are somewhere in the neighborhood of five, in, in the normal place, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 600 students per class. So at any given time, in these places in China, just like in Europe, might be 2,000, 2,500 medical students. Um, in China, I did learn in the final couple of years of their training, they use them kind of like here. They use them a lot for work. So they, they would work clinics and work in the hospital. 
So one of the main points I wanted to make to them uh, was, and, and I want to make to you too, although you kind of know it because you live it, is that in the United States, healthcare really is a business. Still, even though there have been some changes over the last 20 or 30 years, still, for the most part, the principle upon which we do our business is that you do a service, and that's the lingo, you call it a service, you do a service, and then you send out a bill, and you hopefully get paid for that bill. Just like, any, just like if you had a plumber come over to your house and send you a bill, you'd pay the bill. The difference, as you all know, the difference is that the bills go not to the person buying the service usually, i.e. the patient, but rather to a third party. Third party might be an insurance company, might be the federal government in the case particularly of old people and people who have disabilities, that's Medicare, or it might go to the state uh, with some help from the feds, that's for people who don't have a whole lot of money, that's Medi-Cal or Medicaid nationwide. Um, what, what I found really interesting, it was interesting to go to China and give talks because uh, we, were, we were set up very nicely. We had a really nice group organizing what we did, very high end. So each of us, Colleen and I, each of us had our own interpreter. And they were really, really good. And then when we gave a talk, like I'm doing right now, they would sit in a booth, either over in the corner or in the back, with headphones on and listen to what we said and do simultaneous translation which I'd done a little bit of before in Europe. It's a little, it's a little different, it's a little unnerving. Uh, you have to be careful about idioms. You don't want to use those too much. You have to be careful about <coughs> jokes. If you tell a joke, you, you say it, and then you, you want to wait about 10 seconds to see if anybody got it. Um, if they laugh, then you kind of laugh along with them. If they didn't laugh, you kind of try to move along as though you didn't tell a joke. Um, anyway, what got me off on that tangent was that um, the, one of the things I, so I'm talking to them and I'm saying, well, we, it's a business, we create a bill, we send out a bill, we send it to different people. But in this case, we maybe get 60, 65 cents on the dollar for the bill that we sent out. And in this case, we get maybe 30 to 35 cents on the dollar for the bill we send out. And in this case, we maybe get, I don't know, 20 to 25%, 20, 20 to 25 cents per dollar on the bill we sent out. And then I, I, comp I shouldn't have done this, but I complicated things even further and said, and then there are some people who don't have anything at all, and in that case, we get nothing on the bill that we sent out. And realize the insanity of our system as I'm trying to describe it to another country. <laughs> so one of the things I also wanted to tell them, because it's, I think it's relevant to us, and it's really germane to what's going to happen to uh, all of the younger folks in the room, is that people like Dr. Jerkovich, Dr. Farmer, and I, and even Dr. Pevic, are in this group of people who are gonna be, we're old now, but we're gonna be really old in 2040. And we're all gonna be Medicare patients. And that's sort of this, we've talked about this a lot in American medicine, it's this, it's this wave of old people who are gonna come through kind of as a bolus through the system. And it'll be interesting to see how the system chews us up and digests us, or if it's able to do that at all. Interestingly, China's the same way, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, another thing that I actually hadn't realized these, this phenomenon numerically, I knew that sort of about this, but it was the, the question of, okay, how many people in the U.S. really do have insurance? It's about half. In, the, in California, it's, it's half. In the U.S., it's a little bit more than that. Almost all of this is through their employer. So probably just about everybody in the room, that's how you get your insurance through your employer, which in our case is the University of California. And then you can see there's uh, Medicaid and uh, Medi-Cal, uh, individual insurance, that's a relatively small percentage of people. This is the, this is the group that the uh, Affordable Care Act was, part of the Affordable Care Act was really meant to service people who were having a hard time getting insurance because they were trying to insure themselves individually rather than as a pool, and that's what the ACA was really designed to help. Um, and then the uninsured, that number actually is a little lower now after the ACA. 
Something that I think many people in the room are aware of, this is just an aside, doesn't have anything to do with China, but with respect to the market, the big change with the Affordable Care Act in California has not been the exchanges that everybody talks about. When you hear the national debate about, um, oh gosh, you know, in parts of Ohio, there's only one insurer. Well, they're talking about these exchanges that were set up and how the insurers, some of the insurers have left those marketplaces. And that's somewhat important in California, but what's the really important thing that happened in California? The really important thing that happened in California is that Medi-Cal got a whole lot bigger. So states had the option of increasing their Medi-Cal program if they wanted to, increasing the number of people in their Medi-Cal program. And that has happened here like crazy. So we have in the hospital, we used to have probably, I don't know, 10% of the patients we took care of in the hospital who had nothing. Now that number is essentially zero because everybody either has Medi-Cal or can qualify for Medi-Cal. <coughs> that's been the enormous change. And that's been part of the debate about trying to change health care. The states that did that change now don't want it threatened. And part of the rollback from some of the Republican proposals was to roll that back. Anyway, uh, hopefully a fascinating digression I just made. <laughs> so in China, this was really, really interesting to me. It, I had just assumed it's communist, it's centralized government, it's going to be single payer all the way. You go in, it's going to be like England. You know, nobody pays anything. You go in, everybody, all the doctors are employed by the state. But it's not that way at all. And that was a real surprise to me. So it's sort of single payer in that there is a lot of government money that goes into the system. But a huge part of the payment process is fee for service. But it's fee for service where the patient pays cash. There's a, a really high savings rate in the Chinese population, much, much higher than in the US. And the thought is, one of the thoughts is that one of the dominant reasons that people save so much in China is that they're worried about paying for their health care when they get old. Because if you don't have cash, you're out of luck. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. But you do get some help from the government. The government does give money to hospitals. And almost all the care is done in hospitals. The government does give money to hospitals to help subsidize their budget and keep their costs down. But kind of like Medicare or Medi-Cal for us, it doesn't even come close to covering the costs. Some people have insurance. This is the, probably the biggest number you could come up with. And it's only partial. It's not very good insurance in many instances. So it doesn't help the patients that much. Patients pay most of their bills. It is true that if you get your care closer to home, the government helps you more. So in theory, the hospitals are not profit or not for profit places, but because they can't cover their costs with what the government gives them, they have to charge, they have to charge the patient. So if you go in as a patient to uh, receive care in a hospital, and I'll show you kind of how that works too, because it's fascinating, that none of them, they're all self-referrals for all intents and purposes. Um, and you register, you pay a fee out of your wallet. You, you reach into your wallet. If you have a wallet, you reach into your wallet and you pay cash. When you get treated, you pay cash. And in some places, you actually have to, you have to spend money to buy the book that the doctor then uses to write your notes in. And then he or she gives it back to you. But you bought that book at a, at a premium. You bought that book. That's just a way for the hospital to generate money. Um, when you get treated, you pay. And then if you need drugs, and almost everybody gets a drug prescription, partly because that's how they make their money, they charge a real premium for the drugs. My trip there, again, this was a surprise to me. My trip there was sponsored, nicely sponsored, by a Chinese drug company. Now, the drug company is owned by the government, but it's a private business, if you can square those two things together. And there are other Chinese drug companies owned by the government that are in competition with the one that sponsored me, but they're all owned by the government. So there's central control, but some capitalism thrown in. Um, another fascinating thing was that there, in, in, every, in every city we went to, there were a number of Western hospitals, and that's what they call them. They call them, tradition, uh, they call them 
Western hospitals, but there were also a number of traditional Chinese hospitals with tradi traditional medicines. And remember, if the patients are paying out of pocket, those folks are in the marketplace too, right? Patients can go there if they want to instead. In fact, at all the places we went to, the pharmacy would have two windows. There was the Western drugs window and the traditional Chinese drugs window. And the thing they had in common was if you wanted a drug from one of those windows, you had to pay for it. So I said that uh, China is no different than us in terms of its aging population. This graph is done a little funny. I borrowed it from a company that uh, does business in China. But the orange mountain there is, 19, is the population in 1978. You can see they're all young. And then the blue bars are kind of the way it is today, uh, probably even more marked today. And you can see they have a bolus of people going through too, maybe a little bit behind ours. But they have this enormous group of people coming through that they're going to have to care for as they get older. Um, I think the main thing to look at here, I also borrowed this, is the annual growth in healthcare in China versus the US, about a 20% rate of growth. That's a combination of that aging population, but also the fact that they have more money. So if you talk to people there, and we had a really nice guide there who uh, spoke perfect English. The guy, a 30-year-old guy, lived in Shanghai. And he uh, talked about just how his life had changed since the time he was maybe 10 years old. So 20-year time span. And in that time, as people kind of know about what's been going on in China, it's, they've, they've grown enormously in terms of their um, gross domestic product, in terms of their annual rates of growth. And that's reflected in um, how they live their lives now. Everybody's, uh, people, compared to 20 years ago, a lot more people have a nice place to live. There are nice restaurants. There's food available. Uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, food was an issue. Just getting enough food to eat was an issue. And that's still true in parts of the country. But most of the places in the country, and certainly the places where we went, uh, the economy was thriving. People seemed to be doing pretty well. So they, that because the population has more money and because it's getting older, they're spending more and more and more on health care as time goes on, becoming a little bit more like us. So I also wanted to make the point to the Chinese that most health systems in the US are not academic and that academic systems are different because a place like this we not only take care of patients, but we also do research and teaching. And I, they really liked the, the, these next two slides. They really liked these slides because they're really good visuals. I didn't have to say much, so they didn't have to listen to my translation. This is a map I found of all the hospitals in the US. That's kind of a snowstorm of blue. And this it was impressive to me. I compare that to this map which is the academic centers in the US. So it's that versus that. And what the point I was trying to make to them, and the point I would make to you too, although some of you know this intuitively because you live it, that we are in competition in an academic center where we are taking care of patients and sending out bills just like everybody else. We are in competition with all those other hospitals for patients. David Cook, when he was talking about his program, talked about that a little bit, about how um, you know, there are these different places that publish their results. Some of them are academic, some of them are not. Mercy San Juan is not an academic place. Sutter General is not an academic place. They don't have a teaching and they don't have a research mission. It sort of changes the dynamic. In some ways, that's an advantage for us. In some ways, it's a disadvantage. So in China, really busy slide, just look at the colored boxes, that's the important part. In China, a little bit more, because of a central government, this was an area where I think the centralization and the communism does have an effect. They rated hospitals. They, meaning the government, rated hospitals. So they're tier one hospitals, tier two, tier three, and then kind of tier three A plus. The blue box at the top, interestingly, and it, and it says it on the slide, come straight from the Chinese. That's for all our party officials. That's the best possible place that you could go. There'll only be a couple of those in the country. 
in Beijing or Shanghai, big, big cities. Places where we visited were all tier three. Uh, and in fact, we're very proud of the fact that they were three A's. So this, this grading system of the tier one, two, and three was really pretty much about size and the location. The, the A, B, and C was really about quality. So they got rated by the government. Um, I made the point to them that we get rated too, but if you think about it, most of our ratings are not by governmental entities, they're by non-governmental entities. And just to give you some idea of, of how many people there are, and by extension, how many hospitals there are, this shows by province. Remember, we were right, right there. It shows by province, uh, the darker the blue, the more level two hospitals there were, grade two hospitals there were. Uh, but you can see in the province where we are, there were 470 of them. And these are sort of middle of the road hospitals. And then grade three hospitals, this is the highest end. These are these places with 2,000 beds or more. 132 of them in the province where we were. We visited four of those. I found this quite interesting. Remember, the, the, um, I told you earlier, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, there's very little referral um, mechanism there. There's very little, actually there's almost, there's very, very, very little primary care. So if you ask a Chinese person, who's your doctor, they don't have one unless they think that something's wrong with them and they refer themselves to a specialist. So if they say, I'm, I'm short of breath, I've really been getting short of breath, I think that has something to do with my lungs. There's a really good lung specialist in Lao Cheng that I've heard about. I'm going to go to Lao Cheng and see if I can get an appointment. And I'll show you that process in just a second. Um, so they do that. And since the better known people and more of the capacity is in the big hospitals, more of the care is done in the big hospitals. So those grade three hospitals I told you about, it's only 5% of the total number of institutions in the country are grade three but they do about a third of the care. So highly disproportionate. Our clinical delivery is about built around clinical departments and centers. I showed them this slide of our different departments. And then they showed me this slide, which I had trouble reading. <laughs> Um, but they have lots of clinical departments because it includes a bunch of things that you wouldn't necessarily call a department in our institutions. Um, but the same kind of basic rubric. I showed them this picture just because Anne and Lars look so good in these pictures. Um, I wanted to make the point that our hospital is not the same thing as our medical school. And to some extent, that seemed to be true there. But very, very hospital-centric. Remember these patients I told you about, the person who maybe has shortness of breath and wants to see a lung specialist? They didn't go to a clinic. They would go to a hospital, because that's where the lung specialist was. Uh, it turns out, actually, the government would pay you more. They would help subsidize the cost of care more if it was hospital-based as opposed to clinic-based, which is true here, too, for Medicare, at least. So there. Um, we would go, uh, these four places we went, we would go, we'd arrive, get out of our car, and be greeted by uh, maybe 20, 30 people, including three or four people taking pictures, and one or two videographers. We felt like real big shots. Uh, they take us on a tour, I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. And then we would always meet somebody who was kind of, kind of came across as the boss, and there we are looking very statesmanlike, um, taking a picture. We would always go to a conference room and they would greet us. Um, and we, we, the first couple times we did that, we thought this guy was the boss. They would, they would introduce him as the president of the hospital. And there he is, he's, he's giving me a tour. There's my, uh, there's my interpreter. He's giving me a tour and I wanted to show this picture because this is the lob, kind of the lobby of the hospital. Um, over to the right, oh, actually in the background, you can see them there, see all those computer screens? Those are computerized kiosks so that when that person comes in who's short, short of breath, 
they can come in and they go to the, one of those kiosks and ask for an appointment. And if they know the doctor they want to see, they ask for that doctor. And if they don't know the doctor they want to see, they know that it's just something about their lungs, they ask for a lung doctor. And they get an appointment. And it comes out of the kiosk as a piece of paper. And it might say, uh, go here or there to get some labs done, which they would then do, um, paying along the way. They would pay a little bit for the care everywhere they would go. All of that was computerized as well. If they needed, uh, not necessarily a lung disease patient, but if they needed an MRI, they would be directed to the MRI place. And the, in this hospital, which we visited, which is one of the more modern ones we saw, in this hospital, they ran the MRI 24 hours a day with a 30-minute turnaround time for your results. So the way that worked is the patient, remember the patient's directing their own care, sort of. They come in and somebody told them they need an MRI, they get a little ticket that says they need an MRI, it's all computerized. They would go to the MRI place, put it in a machine, the machine would recognize that they were there, they would get called by a human being to go back and have their MRI done, and then they would come back out and wait, and they waited on average about 30 minutes, and then the reading came out on a piece of paper that they would get because they were responsible for their own medical records. So they'd get the reading and then they'd be directed to go to the next place along the way. 30 minute turnaround time, 24 hours a day. Talking about patient satisfaction, that's a pretty good satisfier. Um, and you talk about throughput and access, that's a pretty good way to get some throughput and access. Probably not the most happy thing for the MRI readers who are there at two or three in the morning, but good for patient care. And then, um, and then I showed this. Remember, I said that the patients pay a part of their bill for everything. There was a big computerized board up, all in Chinese, saying, uh, "Here's what everything costs. So, if you're going to get an MRI. Here's how much you're going to pay." So, this guy, the president, has just given us an hour-long tour of this really interesting hospital. But then we go into another boardroom and meet this guy, who's the real president. <laughs> Turns out at this hospital, and this was not unusual, at this hospital there are eight presidents. So we were actually meeting the second president. This is the first president. He wouldn't deign to give a tour to some foreigners. But he's there to talk to us in this setting. We always had tea, um, so it's kind of formal. And then part of the deal was a gift exchange. So. Um, this is Colleen uh, receiving her uh, kind of commemorative soccer ball in the city of Zabo, because Zabo apparently is the home of soccer. It's where soccer was first developed, and they used to play with a ball that didn't have air in it a couple thousand years ago, but one that was just stuffed with something, and that's so a replica of that with some important signatures on it. So Colleen and I each got a soccer ball. And then my gifts, the gifts I brought were UC Davis scarves, some tomatoes, from uh, dried tomatoes from UC Davis farm, and then the big hit was the UC Davis baseball cap. And there he is with this baseball cap. Um, I talked to them about our electronic medical record and how everything was, uh, everything was um, in EHR, and I, there was no place we went to that went to that extreme. Uh, a lot of stuff was computerized, and one of the thoughts that occurred to me was that they have been able to adopt technology there because really they've really only been growing for about the last 30 years. So they were very facile. Everybody was very facile with computers, with cell phones, with paying for things electronically. Uh, I didn't actually, with the younger people that I was with, I didn't see them use cash hardly at all uh, because they just didn't didn't do it. That's not how they, and they didn't use credit cards either. They used their phone. They paid for everything with their phone. And I realized that that's kind of the way it is because they've grown, they've all grown up with it. The country's grown up with it. Anyway, I talked about EHR and how we can have my chart. Um, I already mentioned a lot of this and you can't read it anyway, but this just kind of goes through how the patient um, gets an appointment. I already talked about that pretty much. But again, I would emphasize there's no primary care to speak of. It's all pretty much self-directed. Um, I mentioned uh, Care Everywhere, which some of you may know that, ac that, that name. That's for Epic's way of sharing uh, electronic health records between institutions. They had nothing like that. In fact, 
not only did they not have anything like that, if you got referred, say, from a level two hospital to a level three, you carried your own paper records with you. Um, I talked to them some about finances, told them that the University of California, uh, that we were a University of California hospital. But some of you may know this number. What that means is that the, the state of California helps us to the tune of 3% of our operating budget. So in essence, remember that those maps of all those private hospitals and small number of academic hospitals we're in competition with, we really aren't very different from them, at least in terms of how we're financed. The vast majority of our operating budget comes from taking care of patients and sending out bills. Uh, most revenue for us is from billings. We send out bills. This was the part where I felt crazy. I did talk to them a little bit about relative value units and just like it would for medical students here, it kind of fell on deaf ears. Uh, in China, there's some public subsidy from taxes, both at the national and provincial level. Some insurance I've already mentioned, major cash copays and deductibles. And this was something that they talked to us about. Um, that model of a self-referral and minimal primary care worked for a country with an enormous number of people where a lot of the problems that the people had were, were uh, acute, acute infectious disease illness, acute appendicitis, that sort of thing. It doesn't work very well. Think about it. If you're in China and you have diabetes and you don't have a, somebody you can go to on a regular basis, it doesn't work very well. So they are grappling with that because, especially as their population is aging, just like ours is, they're dealing with a bigger and bigger load of chronic diseases. About 10% of the population is estimated to have diabetes in China, and most of those people don't know they have diabetes and are not being treated for it. So they have a, every five years, it's, remember, it's, it is communist. Every five years, they have a five-year uh, plan for health, and these are some, they have recognized some of the things they need to do. They want more general practitioners, believe it or not, more hospital beds, but they need them because they got so many people. More private sector services, so more insurance paid or self-paid, but not linked to the government. Um, they think that their pharmaceutical, uh, that, that, that their health delivery system is too dependent on profit from pharmaceuticals, and they want to prevent control uh, chronic disease. I told them that we keep track of uh, how much money we make, um, and they do too, but in slightly different ways. I found this interesting. Concentrate only on this. This is the base salary for a, phys a typical physician in uh, China. It's about half of what they make. These two big blocks, which make up most of the remaining half, are incentives. Now, they had a little bit of quality incentives, but mostly it's how hard do you work. They were very interested in the question and answer periods and how much money we make and how hard we work. And they claimed, this is all self-reported data, just like ours is self-reported, they claimed that they worked harder. <laughs> um, I talked to them about telehealth and showed them all these dots on the map about places we have telehealth relationships with and all the different things that we do. This is a picture from the US. And they were proud of their telehealth, too, which really meant, I think, for most of them, teleconferencing. They do that. But they really haven't gotten into the telehealth arena very much, which is not through because of lack of technology. I think it's because of lack, because of the way the system's set up. If your system is really all about tertiary care or all about patient self-referral, you wouldn't do telehealth. You'd kind of need a primary care basis to do telehealth in the way that we're used to it. Well, I'm finishing up here. I talked to them a little bit about disruptive medical professionals. And again, there's a language barrier. So I couldn't tell for sure if they just couldn't relate to this because they don't have anybody who's disruptive or because everybody's disruptive. I couldn't, couldn't really tell. But this actually, for us, just bring yourself back to the United States for a second. This is a really interesting study. It's a little bit dated now, but I, I don't think the truth has changed. That they asked people in an operating room environment, if you have somebody in the OR who's disruptive, and that usually meant a surgeon who gets mad and throws things and nobody wants to work with, that kind of thing, is that bad for patients? 
So again, this is a survey data, take it with a grain of salt. But you can see most two thirds of people thought that there was an increased likelihood of some sort of adverse event if you had that kind of personality in the OR. Uh, everybody thought errors were more likely. Most people thought the patient safety and quality of care were compromised. Three quarters thought that the patients weren't as happy. And this was interesting to me, about a quarter of people said the patient was more likely to die. So I talked to them about that. And they either went away thinking, boy, that's great that the Americans are paying attention to that. Uh, they are really open-minded. Or they thought, man, those Americans are all really disruptive. <laughs> we talked a little bit about hours worked per week. Um, this is data, self-reported data from the US. Uh, I actually thought the numbers seemed a little low to me, but about 80% worked greater than eight hours a day, and the average work week's about 60. Uh, I did find one study for China just responding to their saying, well, we work a lot harder than you do. Average hours per day, 11. Uh, about 73%, three quarters, work greater than nine hours per day. Average days per week, they work weekends. Average hours per week, 63. I, I, I actually think they probably do work a little harder than we do. So just to finish up, uh, healthcare as a business. Surprisingly to me, I thought that the same really was true in China. It's intense competition for patients. Uh, the competition was not with insurance companies or with the government. It was with the patients. It, it was with other players for the patients. Patients made a lot of their own decisions. In fact, most of their own decisions. Um, there are different payers in our country. In their country, the patient is the primary payer. Uh, this academic versus private uh, issue that we have in the US, much less of an issue there because they're all kind of operating under the same system. Um, clinical departments and centers were similar. Uh, they sort of have an electronic medical record. They don't monitor productivity down at the physician level as much as we do, but they do monitor work hours, and that's probably why they tend to work more. Um, they don't have as much telehealth as we do. Again, it, this was a question mark for me. And then I did talk a little bit about burnout there. And they, they kind of looked at me vacantly. So I'm not quite sure uh, they knew what I was talking about. They either thought, I, again, I was really enlightened talking about burnout or that Americans are crazy. I just want to finish real quickly with um, a, a couple of pictures about the food. Uh, one of the really interesting things for us, for Colleen and I, was that everywhere we went, at least for dinner and sometimes for lunch, they would throw us a banquet. And it was actually kind of cool. Some of the food was really good. Some of the food was really disgusting. If you've, if you've never eaten a sea cucumber in a bowl of broth, don't. No. It's not good. <laughs> um, so the, the way these set up, and it sounds like Nihilus has done this, uh, um, these tables were all round. And then the middle of the table was on a motor. So it would go around, and the food would just come by you. And you'd go in and sit down. There'd maybe be three things on this table. Yeah, this is early in the meal, because there's not much there. But by the end, every spot on this table was filled with food. They'd just keep bringing out dishes. And um, again, some of them good, some of them not so good. And then there it was fairly protocoled. It was interesting. It was fairly protocoled where everybody sat. So the host would sit at one point on the table, and then the two guests, that was Colleen and I, would sit to the left and to the right of the host. The more important guests would sit to the right of the host. We took turns, Colleen and I. Um, and then across the way was the second host. And in most of the places where we went, that was the Communist Party official who was part of the administrative structure of the hospital, sometimes a doctor, often not, who sort of minded the doctors and made sure that they didn't stray too far from the communist way. And then at the other two points, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, were the third and fourth hosts. And there was a very protocol way that toasts were done um, by those people in sequence. A lot of toasting done uh, with a combination of red wine, which was pretty vile, and uh, this schnapps-like stuff, which was really good. <laughs> and then just some pictures of some of the food. And I don't have a sea cucumber, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, because I might gag if I looked at it. <laughs> so that's it. Questions? Discussion? Great, Dave. That was great. And so much more fun.
on, I think, than the quality, quality of, of care. So thank you very much for that. All righty. We've got some time. Uh, how much were the labs and the imaging? How much were labs and imaging? So I, I might generalize that question to how much how much did the patients pay? Is that really yeah. kind of what you meant? Not very much by our standards. So um, the unit of money there is either, they either call them RMBs or yuan, and it would be the equivalent maybe in dollars uh, for a, just a routine lab might be a buck or less. It wasn't very much by our standards, but remember the average um, earnings for somebody in China is much, much lower than here. Right. And just really interesting because in South Korea, which is a mm -hmm. democratic country, um, you can see a GI specialist within 20 minutes um, on the same day and mm. pay for antibiotics for a few dollars. My mom had her entire surgery and hospital admission for a week for like $400. No insurance. So is that, uh, so the, the story, if you couldn't hear in the back, was that in South Korea, you could have a big operation for the equivalent of about 400 bucks out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. So that without could, insurance. without insurance. So that could be that the government is covering the difference, mm -hmm. or it could be that it's just not very expensive because they're selling services at a low rate because the competition is so great. Could be both. Um, I th the sense I got in China was it was both. Mm -hmm. So that there was some government money coming in, so they didn't have to charge the patients as much. But remember also that there would be some incentive to keep costs down, because if it got too prohibitively expensive, then the patient could just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And there was no insurance company saying, no, you can't go there. No. Uh, they'd go anywhere they want. They'd go right. down the street to the traditional Chinese place, buy some drugs cheap, and just hope that the traditional uh, cure was going to work. I think this, this specific surgery was at a National Cancer Institute, mm -hmm. an academic center where everyone gets their big cancer operations. but. Um, it's, it might be because the physician can get paid. Right. Mm -hmm. What a great snapshot, uh, insightfully narrated. Uh, I, uh, uh, I love it. Uh, uh, in chatting with folks about the nitty gritty of running a big hospital and systems and stuff, uh, uh, must have come across some interest in uh, length of stay, which is usually quite different versus uh, a hospital in China. And I wonder if you can speak with us uh, about that, perhaps some opportunities going forward for the Chinese hospitals, and uh, the impact on changes in urban infrastructure and stuff uh, on potentially uh, length of stay, development of home care, things like that. So they, that's a good question. They, they, didn't, they didn't seem at all preoccupied with length of stay. They were happy with long lengths of stay. I think their approach was to build more beds. I think they're just trying to service the population first. And so long lengths of stay didn't really seem to bother them. Remember, in our country, the, the focus on length of stay really initially was born out of the DRG concept. So when the, when the federal government started to say, we will pay you a certain amount of money no matter how long you keep the patient in the hospital. That's, I've just oversimplified DRGs, but that's kind of what DRGs say. We became highly, highly incentivized to get patients out as quickly as possible. Because if we got them out quickly, we were spending less money on their care. There was more profit left over from whatever the feds were giving us. That sort of started that. All the other insurance companies kind of do a similar sort of thing now. So that's why we're so paranoid about long lengths of stay. They don't have that. In fact, if the patient's paying for each day that they're there, actually in some ways there's some incentive to build more beds and just keep them full. And uh, also in uh, many cases, uh, back in the day perhaps, uh, folks had to be able to function by the time they were you know, discharged from the medical uh, system and uh, function at a fairly high level. No, that was certainly the case in uh, uh, Japan. You wouldn't be able to do your daily functions as well unless you could, uh, you know, really you know, move around and walk and stretch and all that stuff. That's a good point, and that may have been operative, a lot more operative, say, 20, 30 years ago. Not so much now. It gives me a chance to tell you a fascinating, another digression. That apparently, the culturally, if you have a baby there, um, the deal is that you kind of go under for 30 days. You don't. Don't go out. People take care of you. 
um, they had they showed us a ward in one of the hospitals, uh, which was it, it actually had a company's name on it, so it was sponsored by a company. It was all cash basis only, cash on the barrel for women who just had a baby to spend 30 days in a special ward, which was really really nice. It looked like a nice hotel. Uh, all the rooms were super nice. They had special food. They had a baby washing station, so if you didn't want to wash your own baby, they'd take care of it for you. Uh, they had special they had specialists there, so if you had postpartum depression, they were on it. But this was all on a cash-only basis, so you paid. It was the equivalent, they told us, it was the equivalent of three to $5,000 for 30 days. That's what you paid. So again, for us, we were probably thinking at least one, maybe two orders of magnitude more than that. Um, but for them, that's a fair amount of money. But they do have a burgeoning upper middle class and upper class that can pay for that. And it was full. That unit was full. Jim? Dave, hey, did you get a sense whether a medical student can choose whatever specialty they want, or are they directed by the government to go into certain specialties to meet the needs of the Good question. I didn't. My so guess would be, just based on the way it was there, my guess would be they could pick. Yeah. That would be my I guess. I asked that question when I was in town, and they can pick anything they want. They yeah. can, there's no compulsion. They get to choose to go to medical school and they get to choose a special. Right. Is the surgical workforce fairly healthy there, do you think, for the future? Do you think for that? Um, I, th about surgeons here. I think it's the same. I Actually, that's a, another good question. I don't know that, I certainly didn't get a sense, maybe Bill did, of whether or not surgeons are a special case there. I They just don't have enough doctors, period. I mean, they got, it's the stories that I had heard really proved true about how you just, you may have had the same experience, but you, you're driving along the freeway and then all of a sudden there's 20 high-rise apartment buildings, all 35 stories high, and they're 20, just boom, 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 boom. And they just went up uh, within the last year or two. My, my brother is a professor of veterinary medicine and he, he's a big shot. He's my younger brother and it kind of galls me that he's such a big shot. But he's, a, he's enough of a big shot. Well, he is a, he's a veterinary radiologist and there aren't very many of those in the world, so they get asked <laughs> to go give talks all the time. He's been to China about five or six times over a period of about a decade, and he said he'll, he goes back to some of the same places, and he said he'll go back like a year after the last time he'd been there, and there will be literally new cities that weren't there the year before, a whole city with 100,000 people. So they've got, to, to go back to the point, they. They've got so many people, and it's growing so fast. I think they're just worried about doctors overall. The sorry, sorry. I've got two questions that I said. So, uh, uh, so if, if their patients are kind of driving all of these choices, um, how are they, and just kind of piggybacking on what Dr. Cook talked about this morning, how are they uh, deciding on which of these hospitals are the highest quality that they want to go to? Are there any? So the good, really good question, there's that grading system. So there's one, two, three, and then A, B, and C. And so if you have the means to do it and you want to do some traveling if that's necessary, you'd go to a 3A. You might, uh, a lot of it, from what I heard, a lot of it was you'd go to a particular physician by reputation. It wasn't, wasn't any more, it wasn't any fancier than that. I don't think there was a website you could go to and get quality information like David showed about thoracic surgery. Uh, it's pretty much reputation. So Laura, you just got back from Mongolia. I saw your hand up. Yeah, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. I was um, interested, especially in the balance of inpatient and outpatient care. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I saw in Mongolia too, that the focus was really on inpatient care. There's very little outpatient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And hospital lengths of stay were really long. There's a high ratio of hospital beds to population. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you think that impacts our treatment of patients here as far as cultural competency, what people expect. Do they want to be in the hospital until they're fully well? You know, mm. does that mm -hmm. affect how we care for patients? Um, and then how does how do the outcomes and costs kind of compare as far as like percentage of GDP that's spent on health care and the mortality? So I'll take the last part first. The question was percentage of GDP that's spent on health. It's much, much lower there. I, it's probably a third of what it is here, maybe a quarter. Uh, rising, though. They're, they're rising faster than we are, if you can believe that. Um, 
Culturally, do the patients expect to be in the hospital? That's a good question. I would guess yes. I don't know absolutely for sure if that's true. I may have overemphasized inpatient versus outpatient in that while I said that most of the care, the vast majority of the care is done at hospitals, it's a lot of that is at hospital-based clinics. So there are people who come see the doctor and don't go in the hospital, a lot of them, but they do that in a hospital-based environment. All the clinics were either in the hospital building or immediately adjacent to it. Yeah. I have a question about, you were ta I'm talking a lot about how people don't really have a primary care doctor. So here we focus a lot on screening breast cancer, colon cancer, triple A. Does that get done there? And how does that no. no. I mean, I, I'm extrapolating from a week there to give you a definitive no. <laughs> but uh, gosh, from the way they're set up, I would say no. If 10% if of the population is suspected to have diabetes and don't know it, then they certainly don't know that they have a lump in their breast that's going to turn into a fungating breast cancer. They, they go see the specialist when it reaches that point. And, and, and Dave, uh, public health, vaccinations, things like that, how are those delivered through national That's a good question. I, I don't know. Bill, do you know anything about that? I, you know, I had a horrible time trying to figure out how things are diagnosed, how patients are followed up. So uh, those kind of questions, I, it seemed like you know, I was asking a uh, completely right. different concept. So right. I, I, I went to China twice and asked those kind of questions probably 50 times each time and never came away with a clear answer. So as far as public health, I mean, I, I never got even close to that because I could, I saw these patients with the order of dissections. How do they find out they have dissections? I don't know. They come for a CT scan, mm -hmm. and how do you follow? We follow them up because they write these papers with five-year follow-up. But I cannot get a clear answer. These patients, they say, came from a thousand miles away, from four provinces away, with four hospitals. And I said, how do you follow up? Oh, we follow up all our patients. Well, how do you do it? I never could get an answer to that. So, because how the system runs to me was extremely mm -hmm. opaque. So I could see how the hospital worked, but I couldn't figure out how the patients got there, or what kind of follow they had. Maybe it, it, it gave me a bit of solace. It's, it's not nearly as organized as I had expected it to be. And I sort of thought central government, communism would be really organized. I think they have made efforts at that. It's just the number of patients is really overwhelming. I think, do we need to stop? Yeah, I think so. You know, I took away from this. If you want to live a long time, you've got to be nice to your grandkids because they're going to have to pay cash for you. <laughs> Dave, thanks again.